Today's sermon's entitled, I Am the Door. You know, I love this passage of scripture, and it basically says, first and foremost, Jesus says, I am. In other words, I am God. He starts off with that. And then he says, I am the door for the sheep. I am the way that you get to God the Father in heaven. And I think this is so beautiful for us to remember and to understand. Jesus Christ died on the cross and rose again for us. He atoned for our sins and by our faith in him, not by our works, but by our faith, we become saved born again, masterpieces of God's grace, we become God's very own children. My name is Reverend Derek Gilder, and the pastor at McKee, McKee's Mills Baptist Church. I want to say, blessed be the name of the Lord. I got thinking about doors in particular, and I got thinking about this fellow. Here he is standing in a mansion, and there's a whole bunch of doors. Now, some of those doors seem very friendly, and there's doors that are on the same level as he is, and he can go in and basically pick any door that he wants. But then there's other doors that are up much higher, which doesn't make a whole lot of sense, but they're difficult to get to. And I got thinking, what a beautiful picture, because that really depicts what it is in life. There are many doors that we can easily reach, and some of them really are good, exciting, and interesting, but other ones, not so much so. And there are many doors in our lives that are very difficult to climb up towards and to even open, but yet we still try to do so. And I got thinking, what does a door specifically symbolize to different people? And I got thinking, people have different thoughts and feelings about a door, don't we? For some people. A door represents something that it means opportunity. They look at a door, and even though it's mysterious and it's very secretive, they sit back and say, whatever's behind that door must be for my good. It's brimming with opportunities. It's brimming with something new, something I'd never seen before. And therefore, I got to open the door, and I got to go through that door, and I got to see what it is because I'm excited. I'm enticed. I'm thrilled. I'm just looking at the unending possibilities behind that door, and I am ready right now to open that door and go through it. We've met people like that, and they're certainly they're bold, they're brave, and they know it's risky to open up a door because you don't know what's behind it. But at the same time, they really don't care because they sit back and say, I'm good for it. It doesn't matter. I'll take whatever comes my way. I just want a new experience. For some people, that's what a door represents, new experiences. For other people, a door represents comfort. It represents the idea of getting to know new people. For many people, they look at their door and they say, you know what, as in this picture here, the door isn't even on its hinge because they're inviting. They always want to meet new people that are around them. They want to open up the door of hospitality, their own door and the doors to other people and say, I want to be your friend. I want to get to know you. I want to make you part of my life. And they look at doors as being something as an opportunity to get to know new people. They also know that, you know what, some people are not easy to get along with, but at the same time, they're very optimistic and they're saying most of those doors in life, if we open them, they'll give us an opportunity to expand the people that we know and people that we're friends with. For other people, though, the door represents something else. They want to escape their own reality. They go through life and maybe they're having a really hard time, and a lot of people do. Maybe they're having trouble with the finances or with their marriage, or maybe they're having trouble at their jobs, or maybe they're having health concerns, and they see a door as a possibility of escape. They're looking at the door and saying, you know what? I know it's a risk to go through this door, but it's so miserable, my existence right now. I just see a door as a way to get away from what I'm going through, and I'll embrace what's on the other side of that door. Surely it's better than what I'm going through now. For so for a lot of people, that's what it is. A door represents something that hopefully is better than my current circumstance. And yet for others, the door contains a great amount of mystery and secrets. They look at it and say, you know what, there is a risk that if I go through the door that I'm going to get into a reality, a new situation that I'm not going to like very much. I may have to give up some of the comfort in my life, or maybe I'm going to open the door and it's going to be filled with pain, trials, and tribulations. They sit back and say, I really don't want to open that door, but I don't want anybody else to open it for me either. So they put giant padlocks, as you can see in this picture on the door, to make sure that nobody can come in and to make sure that they don't go out and venture into the unknown. For them, something that lies behind the door is probably scary and frightening. It's probably filled with dark clouds of gloom and ultimately challenges of which they're not going to be able to basically rise to the occasion. They're sitting back saying, I really don't want my life to change. Have you met someone like that? Somebody who says, I like my life exactly the way it is. And if it changes in any way, it's going to change for the worse. So I want to stay right where I'm at. I feel protected by that door. You know what? The truth is, is that doors in life always represent some kind of change for us. 
They represent the choices that we must make in life, and we all have plenty of choices that we have to make. Every single day we make choices, of course, but there's major things in life that we look at that the door represents that we say, you know what, maybe I will venture out in there, and then again, maybe I won't. You see this fellow, he's sitting on the floor. He has cobwebs all around him, and the reason why he has the cobwebs is because he's never really moved. For many people, when they look at the door and they say, it's risky, I could actually go through the door and get trials and tribulations, or I could go through that door and get gloom and doom, or I could get sunshine, but I'm not really sure what this door represents. So they sit at the door and they do nothing. They say, you know what, I'd rather sit here, think about it, analyze that door 50 ways to Sunday, and then I'm going to sit back and I'm going to do nothing. I don't want to take the risk. I don't want to change, make any kind of change in my life whatsoever. And the problem is, is that we have too many Christians who sit in the pew who are just like this here. They've got cobwebs coming off them because they don't want to change. When God comes knocking at the door and says, oh, by the way, i got a great opportunity for you. They look at God and say, I don't dare try that opportunity. What if I fail? What if the people don't like me? You know, what if I get into a situation where I cannot handle it? What if? And they sit back and say, I don't want to take the risk. I don't want to take the challenge. Yes, God could give me many fruits and many blessings if I actually do his will. But I'm not sure if this door really represents God, God's will. So I'm just going to sit back here. I'm going to analyze it to death because I really don't want to change. I don't want to move. I don't want to do anything. I'm paralyzed ultimately with fear. This is not the way God wants us to live our lives. If we live this way, then we're going to stay as babies in Christ. We're never going to grow, and we're never going to realize the potential that God has given us. We all have spiritual gifts, and we all have the ability to do miracles in Jesus' name. Whatever he assigns to us, ultimately, we can go do that, definitely through the power of God Almighty. But we have the want to. We had to have that desire. We had to have faith. And there it is, faith. We gotta believe that God will always do good to those who love Him. We gotta believe that with all our heart. And when God shows us a door, even if it might appear to be a little bit scary, and it might require a little bit of persecution that we're gonna go through, and it might require a little bit of risk, we gotta be willing to take that door no matter what. And a lot of people just simply aren't. Jesus said in the passage of scripture we look at today, He said, I am the door. Who enter, whoever enters through me is gonna be saved. First and foremost, the door that we must all go through and we want to go through, I hope, is salvation. We want to be saved. We want to be born again. We want to be part of God's family. Now, if we really want to understand this statement that Jesus gives, I am the door, we're going to have to explore it just a little bit more. There are many people in our life, I think, who have great influence over us. When we look at the doors of life, in other words, different things that we can do in life, we look at other people that tell us, what should I do? For instance, for many of us, we look to our friends. I got this great opportunity, possibly, or maybe it's the worst mistake I'll ever make, but I got this door in front of me. What do you think I should do? And a lot of times our friends will tell us, give us great advice on whether we should open the door or run away from it. For other people, it's religious people. They'll ask them, what do you think I should do? What do you think is, is the right thing to do in front of God? What kind of experiences should I have or not have? And what kind of doors should I open or not open? For other people, it's looking at the rich and the famous and the powerful. They'll look at it and say, you know what? There's the business person who's got everything together. They got more money than you could ever imagine. And, and we look at them and say, however they got there, the success they've had, the wisdom that they've had, I want a little bit of that. So we go to them for advice. And for other people, they ask their spouse, what do you think? Should I take this door and open it? Do you think it's an opportunity? Or do you think it's one of the worst things I've ever done by opening that door? You see, what we really want to know, and you can see this fellow sitting with his Bible, we want to know if the door is God's will or not. <clears throat> we have to discern that. We have to sit and pray. We have to ask the Lord, do you really want me to open the door? Is that your door for me? Or is that a door for somebody else? Is that Satan's door? Is that the world's door? Or is it yours? You see, we got to ask the Lord because only the Lord truly knows. I mean, yes, we should get advice from godly people. Absolutely from our godly friends, from, you know, your pastor, from, from people who are business people or God-fearing business people, that is, through our spouse. Absolutely, all of those are valid opinions, and we should get those. But the one opinion that matters the most is the Lord's. What does the Lord say about the door? And for many cases, a lot of people, a lot of Christians, don't bother asking. 
They just sit there and, and, and think about the door, but never open it up or never even bother figuring out if it's a good or bad door. Let's talk about this a little bit more with a story from the Bible so we can get a little bit of understanding of what we're supposed to do with the doors of life. There's a story about a person who was born blind. He was never able to see, even from birth. And we're going to examine this story because it tells us much about doors in life. You have the situation where the um, disciples, they go with Jesus. And they're going down <clears throat> this town and they see this guy and he was born blind. Obviously, the disciples knew exactly who this individual was. He had a reputation. Of course he did. He was born blind. Of course, the Israelite people didn't understand how that could be possible. They believe from the Old Testament, especially from Moses, who said, if you do the right things, if you follow God, if you obey his commands, you will be blessed. If you don't obey his commands and you don't follow them, then you're going to be punished. So they looked at this man and said, how could he be born blind? He couldn't have sinned inside the mother's womb. What could he have possibly have done to deserve being born without eyesight? So they said to Jesus, what was it? Did this man sin? Did this man look at a door that you see up at the very top that was very dark? But it looked beautiful. It had a great design on it. And this guy decided to open that door. Or was it his parents? Did his parents get enticed by sin? And they opened up that door. Why did this man get born blind? Jesus looked at the disciples and said, you're mistaken. Neither this man nor the parents sinned. Actually, I did this to demonstrate my power and my glory. Then he turned around and he looked at the fellow who was born blind. He went and he spit on the ground and he made a little bit of uh, mud out of his saliva. And then he took the uh, mud and he put it on the man's eyes, as you can see in the picture. Then he told the man, I want you to go to the pool of Siloam and I want you to wash the mud from your eyes. Of course, for any of the rest of us, that would be a really daunting task. We wouldn't be able to get there because we got mud in our eyes. But for this guy, he was born blind. He knew how to get a boat even without his eyesight. So he still hasn't got his eyesight. He's got mud in his eyes and he goes all the way to this pool of Siloam, washes out the mud, and lo and behold, now he can see. Of course, everybody's talking about this. Everybody's saying, oh my goodness, this man can actually see. He's never been able to see. This is truly a miracle. And of course, that got the attention of the Pharisees. Pharisees sat back and said, what is going on? It seems like this might be a miracle. We've got to find out because people are going towards this man and they're, they're basically not paying attention to us. And we really don't like that scenario. The parents of this individual, this man, they sat back and the Pharisees started asking them questions. They said, you know what, was your son really born blind? Really? Honestly? Of course, everybody confirmed that, so they had to leave that questioning. And then they sat back and said, wait a minute, hold on a second now. You know what? What were the circumstances in which this miracle happened? Tell us all the details. And of course, the parents are sitting back going, I don't think we really want to say too much. We know and we understand that this was Jesus Christ, the Messiah, who actually did the healing and did the miracle. And the Pharisees have already said, anyone who says Jesus is a Messiah, we're kicking them out of the uh, synagogue. They're not allowed to worship God with us anymore. So they sat back and said, you know what, we're not going to say anything. This doesn't sound like a good idea. So they looked at the Pharisees and said, our son is of age. Why don't you ask him yourself? We're not going to tell you anything. So they basically chicken out. They say, no, we're not going to handle this. We don't want to, you know, throw our faith out there and say, you know what, we're, we understand that Jesus is the Messiah. They wouldn't do that. So the Pharisees get in front of the son. And they say, tell us the circumstances. First, were you born blind? And he said, of course I was. You already know that. And then he, they went on. They said, you know what, we got a problem. We got an issue here. How could Jesus be the Messiah considering he did a sin on the Sabbath? He healed on the Sabbath, which according to them was a sin. And they said, how could he possibly be the Messiah? And then they flipped the coin and said, oh, by the way, can a sinner, though, do a miracle in the first place? So they're kind of perplexed. So on the one hand, they're saying, ah, this guy can't be the Messiah. And on the other hand, they're saying, but obviously he did a miracle. So where did the miracle come from? And what's going on here? And basically all they wanted to do was, was look at Jesus and say, you're wrong. You shouldn't have done the miracle. They were trying to trap Jesus the very best that they could do. When they asked the son, they said, you know what? What's going on here? Is this man a sinner? Do you think he's a sinner? Do you think he's a really bad man? In other words, he did do a miracle on the Sabbath. Do you agree he's a bad man? And of course, the man looked at him and said, I don't know whether he's a sinner or not, but here's what I do know. I was blind, and now I see. That you cannot refute, he told the Pharisees. And of course, they looked at him and said, oh, wow, okay, fair enough. Now, to understand the story, 
we're going to have to dive a little bit more into the historical background. We have to understand the Pharisees and their position in society before we can truly understand what's going on in all the details of the story. When we look at the Pharisees, the truth is they were a group of individuals. They started out right. They wanted to have purity within the culture of Judaism. They sat back and they said, we have no formal authority of any kind. Only the Sadducees were in charge of the temple system. But they got informal authority by telling, first and foremost, the priest, you're not living good and holy lives yourself, and you're not teaching the people how to live good and holy lives. And they went to the populace and said, we'll show you how to get closer to God. We will be the door. We will be the gatekeepers. We will be the gateway into coming closer to God because the priests are not doing it. <laughs> they told them. You had to be separate. You were told a long time ago, Moses said, you got to be separate. You got to be distinct from society. You got to be holy. You're set apart for God. You are to be a light unto the nations, ultimately. And they said, you know what? The Pharisees said, you're not living up to that expectation of God, but we'll point you in the right way, for we are the door to get to know God far better. And of course, the people were sitting back saying, well, we want to know God and we want to please God. So they listened to the Pharisees. And in turn, they got quite a bit of authority. What happened was the Pharisees sat back and took the Mosaic law, and they basically wrote out additional laws. And they said the Mosaic law was too difficult to understand. So they started writing out other laws, and they said, you know what? Here's a law that we have in the Mosaic law. Here's our interpretation of it, and here's what you must do in everyday life in order to fulfill this law. You can see this fellow, a Pharisee, sitting there, and he's got a small book and a big book. And you think the big book would be the Bible, and the small book would be what would be called the Mishnah, this grouping of all these laws that he was basically making up. But the reality is the opposite was true. The, uh, the big book was the Mishnah. It had over 613 different laws that were written out, and they were passed down traditionally from one person to another. And they related to all sorts of things like dietary laws, and, and they related to you know the washing of cups and pots and other utensils. And they basically told the Israelite people, if you do all these things, 613 laws, then you are fulfilling the Mosaic law and you are pleasing God. Of course, we know uh, once we do a little bit of research that that wasn't true. Jesus looked at them and said, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You're like whitewashed tombs. On the outside, you appear very beautiful, but on the inside, you're full of dead men's bones and all things unclean. Iran said, So you too, outwardly, you appear to be right in front of other people, but the problem is, is that you're full of hypocrisy and you have no law in you at all. Think about that for a moment. Jesus was basically saying, you know what, you have elevated the traditions, your traditions, your laws that you made up that didn't come from God, you've elevated those traditions above the law of God. And a lot of your traditions, Jesus said, actually contradicts God's law. So you're actually not getting closer to God at all. You're actually moving further away. The Pharisees made their door look very beautiful, didn't they? They said, you know what, if you follow all these 613 everyday laws, then you can fulfill all of the bigger law that God actually gave them. And in doing so, that you're going to get close to God. But the reality is, no matter how much you whitewashed that door, what did it lead to? Jesus said, death. You will not get closer to God. You will not have a relationship with him. You will not go to heaven if you try to get there by your works. If you try to get there by the Pharisaic law, you're not going to make it there, period. So now, let's talk a little bit about Jesus. Now that we know a little bit about the Pharisees, Jesus says, oh, by the way, I am the only door by which you get to God. The only door. You're not going to get there through the religious leaders. You're only going to get there through me. And I got thinking, praise be to God. Amen to that. Let's go back to the story. See how the Pharisees. Now they're going to ask this man a question again. You know, were you really born blind? They're going to ask him another question again. They're going to say, you know what? Here's what I want to know is not only were you really born blind, but the second question they wanted to know was, ah, what's going on? What's going on? Tell us more details. We want to know, did this man really heal on the Sabbath? And tell us all the details so that we could basically go after Jesus and say that he's a sinner and that he's wrong. The man looked at him and said, you know what? Why do you want to know more details? I don't understand the purpose of this. Why? He said, do you really want to be a follower of Lord Jesus Christ too? Is that why you're asking so many questions? Of course, the Pharisees were quite mad because they understood what the man was saying. The man was saying that he was a follower of Jesus Christ. 
Unlike his parents, who were too scared, too chicken to actually admit that, the son was more than willing. He said, I am a follower of Jesus. I am a believer. First, I want you to know that. Yes, you'll kick me out of the synagogue, but that doesn't matter because I was blind and now I see. And then he goes and says, would you like to be a disciple of Jesus? He told the Pharisees, basically, you are not going to make it in heaven. You are not disciples of the Lord. You are not in good standing with God. And he sent back saying, do you really want to be disciples? Because if you do, I can tell you how. And, of course, they're all looking at him going, wait a minute now. We rejected the Messiah, and we don't like what you're saying. They were quite bitter with him. Because for the Pharisees, this certainly was true. The Pharisees believed there was a certain way to know God, a certain way to have a good relationship with him. One of the ways that you do that is by following the Old Testament laws, and another way was through the, the Mishnah, basically their traditions that they had created. They also believed ultimately that you had to be an Israelite person. In other words, you had to be a descendant of Abraham, or you had to be, <coughs> pardon me, what was called a proselyte. In other words, you had to convert to Judaism, or you couldn't get to heaven. They had a prescribed way, and ultimately their big way of getting to heaven was come follow us. In other words, come follow our teachings. Come put us on a pedestal. Come make us greater than everybody else inside of the synagogue. Come believe in us, and you'll make it to heaven. That's what they thought. And Jesus said that's not the case at all. He looked at all the people, especially the Pharisees, and he said this, I tell you, that something greater than the temple is here. That is the kingdom of God. I tell you this to the Pharisees and everybody else. If you had known these words, I desire mercy, not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the innocent, Jesus Christ, for the Son of Man is the Lord of the Sabbath. In other words, whatever Jesus wants to do on the Sabbath, that's his right. Why? Because he created this world. He created all of us. He sat back and said, you don't understand. I want you to know the purpose of the law, the meaning of the laws, the reason why they were written in the first place. And if you understood that, you would know what I did on the Sabbath was mercy. It was grace towards this fellow. It wasn't work. It was actually an act of kindness. And I didn't break the laws at all. But the Pharisees didn't get that because for them, they didn't understand the law that well. They really didn't get it. For the Pharisees, when they looked at the law, they looked at the letter of the law, but they forgot to understand the spirit of the law. They forgot to go into the law and say, you know what? There's meaning behind this, these laws. And the meaning is far more important than just mechanically following the law. I'll give you an example. In the New Testament, on the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says, you know what? You're not supposed to commit adultery. You're not supposed to sleep around when you're married. You're not supposed to go out and sleep around with somebody else. But Jesus says, I tell you the truth. You have already committed adultery the moment that you start dreaming, fantasizing, looking at another person and thinking about sleeping with them or having sex with them. You know what? That's already a sin. You've already committed adultery. He was trying to tell the Pharisees, understand that you're supposed to be distinct and holy for God, not for your own reputation, but for God alone. And of course, the Pharisees didn't like this very much. Jesus went on and he said this to him. He said, very truly, I say to you, Pharisees, anyone who does not enter the gate the way that I have told you to enter it through Jesus Christ, God's one and only son, is a thief, is somebody who's trying to break in through another way and they will not make it into the kingdom of God. He was trying to tell the people, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes unto the Father except by me and through me. He's trying to tell the people that if you really want to have significance in your life, you've got to go through the door called salvation. You've got to believe in the atoning sacrifice of the Son. If you don't open that door, or if you try to open it in a different way, or you try to listen to the Pharisees and say, it's by works I can open that door and make it to heaven, you simply won't get there. And that's the statement that he's trying to say. God ultimately is seeking those who thirst for him, those who want to hear him. You know, Jesus says to the Pharisees, the sheep know my voice. They know who I am. They know I am from God. They also know your voice and they know you're not from God. And you're only interested in getting praise from the people around you, but you're not interested in actually living for God. You're not interested in being humble. You're not interested in giving up your life over to Jesus Christ and actually living a good life. You're not interested in that at all. And that makes sense. Now, here's the thing. The Bible's very clear on this. It says in the end times, and I think we are probably in the end times. We don't know with certainty because nobody knows when Jesus Christ will return. Only God the Father knows. But I think we're getting closer. 
And it says in the end times that there will be a whole bunch of sheep that will be sent our way, but inside of the, out, the outward appearance of sheep will be a wolf. In other words, inside of them are going to be wolves. A bunch of wolves that are going to dress up like sheep and they're going to try to deceive us, even the elect, even if that were possible, it says in the Bible. So you got this situation when there's a bunch of wolves amongst us, and he says, Pharisees, you are the wolves. You're the ones who are trying to get people to worship you instead of God, and that's wrong. Now, here's what I want to say about this. It's not wrong for us to get advice from other people. It's not wrong for us ultimately to, to say, uh, I want my pastor to, to tell me about whatever. I want to spend time with my pastor. I want to get some counseling. I want to learn about God's word. I want to ask him questions about God's word. There's nothing wrong with getting advice from religious leaders. Definitely not. There are people that it says in the Bible, some are going to be prophets and some teachers and some pastors and, and so on and so forth. If you've been endowed as a pastor, then yes, you have to give God's word and you are the shepherd of your flock. And, and so, you know, what? there's nothing wrong with seeking advice from a pastor. But what is wrong when the pastor says, I am the way, the truth and life, when the pastor is more interested about their own reputation rather than in God, that's when it becomes wrong. That's when you got to sit back and say, that's that's one of those sheep that inside have a, uh, have a wolf, and I don't want to follow that person at all. Jesus goes on, he says this, The door to God's kingdom ultimately <coughs> will not be found in the traditions of people. They will not be found in our own prefabricated idea and thought of how we're supposed to get to heaven. We cannot make up a door that seems easy to us, convenient, that allows us to sin and do anything that we want in life and expect still to get to heaven. Going through that door will not make us go to heaven at all. The truth is, it's only through the faith in a risen Savior that we will actually get there. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and life for a reason, because he's the only way that we get to heaven through submission to him and saying, Jesus Christ, I believe you died and rose again for me. You atoned for my sins, and now I want to know you. I give you my heart. I make you the Lord of my life. This is how we open that door, and we actually get to be born again. And of course, we can't open that door without God's help. It's not through humanity's help, albeit many people will plant seeds of righteousness in our life and other ones will water it. In the end, Apostle Paul says, the only one that can make the seed grow, the only one that can allow us to be saved is the Holy Spirit. It's only through the power of the Spirit that we'll go from death to life. And Jesus said, I am the door. I am the way. If you want to know God, you come through me. You don't come through any other way. So if you're looking for the door, the door that says, I want to be saved, I want eternal life, that door can only be opened when you have faith in Jesus Christ, and it's only through the Holy Spirit that the door is opened in the first place. It's not done by Pharisees. It's not done by other people. There's part of our salvation that we just got to own ourselves. Nobody else can actually save you. I wished I could, because then I would look at all the entire world, and I wish them all to be saved. And if they could be, I would love that, but I can't do that. That's not the way it works. Everyone has free will. Now, let me say in conclusion, there are many things that we got to think about. we got to take a challenge to look at things from another perspective that maybe we haven't. We will always be faced with many doors and many challenges in life. And there will be certain doors that we've got to be ready and willing to actually open up. I got to think about Jesus who said, you know, I am there. I'm knocking on your door. If anyone hears my voice and opens it, I'll come in and be with him. I will dine with him and him with me. The question is, is Christ, is he knocking at your door? Does he have doors in your life that you should open? You see, when we look at doors of life, we look at many of them. They're very confusing, aren't they? They are fraught with the possibility of, of all sorts of bad things. It is always easier to stay where we are in most cases, but not always. And when we look at doors, we wonder, is it going to be something good if I open it? Am I going to walk through it and get all sorts of opportunities? Or am I going to walk through it and find out that I get a whole bunch of tribulations and problems? What does a door actually look like on the other side? It can be very perplexing and absolutely scary when you see hundreds of doors before you every day, decisions that you get to make, and you wonder, which one should I make in the first place? That can be quite frightening. The key to understanding which door is the right one, the one that Christ is on the other side, knocking on the door saying, this is the door I have designed for you. The way that we know how is through prayer. We've got to ask the Lord, 
through prayer and supplication, through meditation. We've got to ask Jesus Christ, which door are you knocking on? And which one do you want me to go through? And the second we know which one it is, we've got to go through with every bit of our effort, with great passion and great faith, knowing that Jesus Christ always does good to those that love him. We've got to understand that and rejoice in that. It's sad when I see people inside of a church congregation who have all the potential in the world, can do great things in Jesus Christ's name, but choose not to do so because they just want to sit. They don't want to try anything new. They don't want any new challenges. And they're too frightened or too scared. Or maybe they're just mediocre in their faith with Jesus. And they say, I really don't care to open any doors anyway because I don't want to do anything. They just sit there as sleeping giants. And I think we've got to be more than that. I think we've got to look at and say, Lord, whatever door you have for me, I will open that through your power and your might, and I will gladly go through it. I want to say not every door that you open, even if Jesus Christ is knocking on the other side, will be a good one. And not initially anyway. There are many things that we go through doors that we face persecution, trials and tribulations of various kinds. But the truth is, if we just hang on when we go through that door, Jesus says, my yoke is very easy. If it gets too hard for you, trade yokes. And go through the door anyway. And I will sustain you. I will help you. I will protect you. I will make sure that if if the absolute worst thing happens to you, you happen to die, I will take you home myself and you will go to heaven. Think about that. What a beautiful promise. So we don't need to be scared of the doors of life, but we have to be cautious. We don't want to sit and, and, and like the guy in the mansion and look at all the doors and sit back and say, I don't really think I want to go to anywhere. I don't want to try any of these. This is way too complex. We've got to sit back and say, Lord, you show me which door. I'm going through it. And that door will change in your life. There will be times when God will say to go through one door. Dimes when he'll say, go through a different one. Just be ready and willing and say, yes, Lord, whatever doors for me, even if it's one of those doors up there that I can't see any way to get to, I know you'll make a way because if you want me to go through that door, I'm going through it with all my might. And I'm going to go through it with the courage and the faith and with boldness. Why? Because I know that you'll enable me through the door. And this is what we got to do as Christians. So I want to implore you on Christ's behalf, not only be reconciled unto Jesus Christ, unto God himself through the Son, but also take the challenge. When God knocks on your door and says, I want you to serve, find a way. Find a way to say yes. Find a way to open that door and go through it. Because guess what? That's where God wants you to be. If you want to get closer to God, you've got to listen to his son, not to the Pharisees, not to other individuals necessarily, albeit there's lots of good Christians out there that can give you great advice. In the end, none of their advice, none of it even begins to compare to what the Lord can tell you. Tell him, I am here, Lord. I will do whatever you want me to do, whatever door you want me to open, no matter how challenging it is behind it, I will go through it because you asked me to open the door. Open the door, O Lord Jesus Christ. Open the door. Because I don't want to stay where I'm at right now. I don't want to stay immature in the faith. I don't want to stay defiant towards you and sin against you. I just want to open that door and be with you in everything that I do. So ask him, Lord Jesus Christ, give me the faith. Give me the courage. Allow me to open that door through your might, through your power, of course, Lord. And help me to go through to the other side. And whatever is there is your will in my life. Amen. I'm going to be there. This is a challenge that I give you today.